on the major city in South Vietnam was uh, really congested, and they burned something of a combination of it smelled like castor oil and alcohol and, and hard cider uh, in their cars and their motorbikes. Absolutely, uh, you were overwhelmed with a stench of exhaust fumes. Uh, the sewage in the town was not that good, so you also had that uh, permeating the air. So I guess one of the things that I remember about Vietnam is not only some of the things, uh, the visual impacts that uh, I had, but also uh, the smells. Uh, here I am riding in a rickshaw. You can see my shoes in the foreground and really get a first-hand view of some of that exhaust and pollution that seemed to be the norm in that city. It was hard to imagine that uh, for a war going on, uh, that uh, life in the cities uh, was reasonably normal, except of course at night, and that's when I guess we all got insecure, particularly those of us uh, from the United States, because there it was very difficult to tell who was who they all look alike, as they say, and uh, by day someone could have been uh, your friend, and by night he may have been uh, a representative of the Viet Cong or North Vietnamese. You really couldn't tell. There are an awful lot of Europeans there, uh, many of them in secretarial or uh, clerk positions, uh, supporting the effort, and of course there were a lot of local girls there. This was taken at MACV headquarters, which was a command area set up uh, primarily for the press. And I worked with them uh, extensively in uh, ranging for all of my trips uh, throughout Vietnam. I went to, I guess, 17 different locations. And spent a lot of time on the air, mainly uh, because uh, I did not want to uh, be on the ground in any combat conditions, basically because I was afraid, didn't want to get hurt, folks. That's one thing I never had was uh, any uh, leanings toward heroics. Basically chicken, I guess, would be the best uh, description for that. Uh, this was taken at Thompson at Air Base, and these are C-123s. I spent uh, a couple of days with a C-123 group. And their primary responsibility in Vietnam was to supply uh, the numerous outposts out on the Mekong uh, Delta and along coastal areas of the South China Sea. And they would uh, fly over these outposts, in many cases would not land to unload uh, their supplies. They would just merely fly in extremely low over the treetops with the back of the aircraft open, the cargo plane, and just shove the material out. I've often wondered uh, how many people on the ground were wiped out, dismembered, or whatever, uh, from being hit by some of the cargo that was shoved out the back, in this case, concertina wire. That's wire that's used to string about the perimeter of the outpost to discourage uh, unfriendly elements from entering the compounds. All of the people on these planes would not wear flak jackets. Uh, they would sit on their flak jackets. For obvious reasons, I guess, if you uh, did pick up any ground fire, the flak jacket would uh, be most helpful in uh, maintaining any of your prized possessions, I guess is the reasoning behind that. And this, of course, is happening uh, much quicker than you're seeing it here because of the difference in the projectors, the 16 and the 24 frames. And as you may have noticed there, one of those parachutes did not open at all. And I suspect a very high percentage of the cargo that was shoved out the back of the C-123s was never recovered, probably landed uh, God knows where and may still be in that same location today. Some of the airfields were pretty good there in Vietnam where we would land and uh, disgorge some of the equipment and uh, material. And some of the runways were absolutely atrocious, uh, just kind of dug out of the ground by bulldozers. 
and landing was one thing and taking off was uh, quite another. Uh, many times in taking off with uh, these crews, I felt that we were just not going to get the aircraft off the ground. But uh, they were always successful, at least when I was there, and no problem. And many of the outposts we would fly into, uh, the people uh, who were there, the reception committee, whether they were Montagnard tribesmen or uh, local Vietnamese, uh, Arvin troops or whatever, uh, Korean rock troops, uh, you really uh, had a very strange feeling that, gee, we could be landing right in the midst of the enemy and not even know it. These are some aerial photos of coastal areas along the South China Sea. The hospital ship Hope was anchored uh, out there and handled many of the wounded. I visited that uh, ship later on and we'll talk about some of the impressions there. And at this remote airfield, uh, you just really never knew who was coming out to meet you. Didn't look like your neighborhood friendly types at all. And of course, everyone uh, and his uncle and brother were carrying guns. This is a small marine detachment going out on parole, uh, patrol, rather. Two young men that I met in uh, Vietnam and uh, had a great opportunity to trade my tape recorders and camera gear for a lot of contraband guns and collector's items, but uh, never quite had the nerve to do that. Was always afraid the postal inspector would open up the package on the way back to Cincinnati. So I never got around to trading off for any of the contraband, but uh, in retrospect, wish I had of, because there would have been some great collector's items there, particularly in guns and weapons and things of that sort. The hospital ship Hope, which is anchored out in the South China Sea, uh, I was aboard that and probably had the deepest and longest lasting uh, impressions of the Vietnam War because on that ship uh, it was just tier after tier and hold after hold of young American servicemen uh, badly wounded and disfigured and uh, really uh, had their lives ended uh, even though they were still alive at a very early age. And uh, I had never seen anything like that before. And it was overwhelming, uh, the implications of something like that. And of course, I was in a situation where I was a civilian and not taking orders from anyone, and so I really didn't have to go anywhere. I didn't want to. As a result, I spent an awful lot of time in the air at the officers' club in Saigon that you see here, and in my nice air-conditioned hotel room. And uh, that in itself gives one pause for reflection because death and destruction are about you, and yet you have the uh, ability to select your own environment uh, in safe conditions, uh, and other people don't have that choice. So definitely an eye-opener for me. Here's part of the Mekong Delta. The Delta was pretty much uh, in control by the Vietnamese revolutionaries. And uh, our troops and uh, our allied troops, if you will, were in control of small command posts and out areas, but that was basically it. And of course, we controlled the major cities uh, for the most part with uh, some instances uh, where the control wasn't that good. I always had difficulty in Vietnam. Being a civilian all of my life, I couldn't tell a general from a private. And uh, many times I would be ignoring the general and uh, talking with uh, one of his aides, thinking he was really the kingpin. And that was very true here in my first meeting with uh, the Marine General Louis Walt because uh, when I went up to uh, these two individuals, there's the general, I ignore him and talk to his aide, which is out of camera range on the left. I don't think he cared much for that. And later on, uh, during this journey by helicopter, 
uh, I learned that he was the general and that I had uh, basically snubbed him. So I tried to make reparation for that uh, as much as possible. A lot of this uh, uh, film is incomplete and in a lot of it ended up on the so-called cutting room floor and a lot of it uh, couldn't be shown. And this is basically uh, part and parcel of the film that we brought back to Cincinnati and uh, presented at many of the schools and service clubs in that area over probably almost a full year. Uh, the shipping channels were just absolutely jammed with ships that were bringing war material into uh, Vietnam as well as the airports. Uh, it was an incredible display of American uh, might uh, and uh, monies expended. This country is only uh, about the, at least South Vietnam, is uh, about the same size as the state of Florida. And yet uh, our country, one of the strongest in the world, was unable to uh, gain a foothold there, which probably tells you something about uh, the character of the South Vietnamese and North Vietnamese. And of course, I think we were only there for economic reasons, certainly none, uh, not reasons that uh, had anything to do with communism and the advance of communism and all of that uh, insanity. These photos were taken in and around uh, Da Nang Air Force Base. And these hills that we were flying over uh, when I left Vietnam, they were secure at this time, but when I left Vietnam, those hills were totally in the control of the Viet Cong. When I left, it was uh, just to preface the Viet Cong Tet Offensive, which began around the latter part of 1966 and early part of 1967. And it was really the uh, clarion call, the beginning of our forced departure from that country. Had it not been for helicopters uh, and airplanes, uh, I would not have gotten around Vietnam very well because I studiously avoided transportation in jeeps and over country and through jungles not interested in that mode of transportation at all when I was there. And a funny thing about uh, sea rations that I'm eating here, I really enjoyed them. And uh, don't know why anybody would complain about them because I thought they were very good. Spent a lot of my time eating sea rations uh, when I would go out with helicopter crews land at various locations, uh, most of the time we ate. And I remember this man uh, only because he has a weird name, Colonel Derryberry. How's that for a name? Can you imagine being a soldier and being commanded by Colonel Derryberry? There's General Walt of the Marine Corps and Congressman Taft, then Congressman, later Senator, uh, later to be defeated by Metzenbaum. And uh, I guess one of the advantages of traveling with the then congressman was that he did carry a lot of weight, and consequently we were able to go to a lot of places that normally would not have uh, been accessible to me, uh, being a poor, a raggedy-ass uh, Midwestern news reporter. But with Taft, uh, I could ride his coattails pretty much to about anywhere we wanted to go. Here's a pretty good uh, shot of the Mekong Delta and the Mekong River. And the Mekong Delta and the river are probably the primary reasons that we were in Vietnam because they offered an awful lot of economic advantage to us in that there are growing seasons year-round in the Delta, which is very rich. And the hydroelectric uh, potential of the Mekong River is incredible. A lot of drop in that river and a lot of current. And so the combination of those two would have uh, produced uh, tremendous amounts of rice and would have probably given our country something of a handle with the Chinese when we were at odds with them at that time. At least that was the, the thought during that period. That's all changed now, of course. I always felt very insecure in helicopters, 
number one, they were very, very slow, and number two, they were always flying very, very low. As a result, any uh, rice farmer with a 12-gauge shotgun could have really done you in. But luckily, uh, I was never in a situation like that, probably because I did everything I could to avoid being in a situation like that. We landed at a soccer field here and met a few of the local brass and the fellow there with the short sleeve shirt and the crew cut is with the CIA, naturally. I'm sure he's there doing good things for the populace. And uh, on these trips, we would uh, meet the local military brass, then the village leader that you see here. And uh, that's a correspondent from Switzerland, by the way, who just shook hands. And then we would uh, meet all the boys from the Cincinnati, uh, Hamilton, uh, northern Kentucky, uh, tri-state area, I guess, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. And uh, I don't remember these uh, fellows' names. Uh, one thing I do remember uh, very distinctly is that uh, they had a slight accident with their Jeep. They were traveling ahead of us. And as you can see, the windshield wiper's still working there, but their Jeep went off the road and into an irrigation ditch. And the weather was a little bit uh, defecatorial uh, in Vietnam. Uh, one day could be very sunny, and the next uh, you could have monsoon-like rains coming down. And roads could become very impassable very quickly. We're on our way back uh, to uh, the city of Saigon now. And uh, this next section of uh, the film, I uh, believe, uh, deals with the black market area there in Saigon. It was interesting to me to note that uh, that all of the goods that we sent over there of all of them, uh, much of it uh, never made it to the servicemen and never made it to the PXs and uh, the cafeterias and where it was intended. Much of it was intercepted on the ports uh, by whomever. And I'm sure that uh, the Vietnamese, in collusion with uh, our people, uh, worked together to provide probably uh, one of the most efficient black market operations in uh, all of Southeast Asia because they literally had uh, everything uh, in these uh, black markets. Here we are coming back to Tonsonut Air Base. And as you can see, it was a big air base. And can you imagine, handled more traffic than O'Hare Airfield in Chicago. Boggles the imagination. Now you know where your tax money goes when you pay your income tax, Holly. And soon, Heather, you'll be paying income tax. And you will be happy to know that uh, not all of it gets spent for a good purpose. Much of it to haul congressmen running around for political purposes. In that picture, Taft kind of looked like he might be one of the Viet Cong. Here in Saigon, this is the black market area. and. Uh, Holly, you'll remember a lot of this, I'm sure, because we showed this film at your school, but uh, Heather, it might be of some interest to you. You can see all of the American products that are on sale, and you could actually buy uh, these products on the street for a fraction of what it would cost you back in uh, Cincinnati or Columbus or anywhere in the lower 48. All of it was being sold at a fraction. That was the place to go shopping. No one ever shopped uh, anywhere but the black market because the prices were so ridiculously little. That's uh, dried fish. Not necessarily an American item. It's always interesting to me, even uh, the clergy were there getting a good deal. While all of this is happening, another American uh, flying off to the jungles in a helicopter. Really a sad testimony to the human condition.
And there's really the saddest part of any war, of course, and that's the young children. And I've often wondered where these young children are today. Are they still alive? Are they grown up? Where are they? Perhaps they've migrated to the United States. Who knows? But such is life. We're coming to the concluding part of the film now, and uh, this was taken out of Benoit Air Base. And these are, I believe they're F-100s, but I'm not uh, sure, because it's been quite a while, 1966. It's quite a few years gone by. But uh, it was interesting in that uh, these little planes, Cessna 150s, would fly out. They're spotter planes, they called them there. And they would be followed by these uh, jet fighters. And the spotter planes would then uh, fly very low over the jungles uh, and uh, encourage uh, any of the Viet Cong, uh, our so-called enemy, to uh, fire at them. And once it was established that they had been fired upon, uh, then these uh, jet aircraft would then uh, come into the location. The spotter plane would drop a smoke uh, flare. And then these planes would come in and uh, absolutely obliterate the entire area around it, uh, which uh, could have been, uh, you know, two people with a gun, but they would spend uh, tens of thousands of uh, pounds of uh, rockets and bombs to, uh, to take out whatever uh, dissidents there were in that area. Again, this film uh, was shot uh, under much faster circumstances than you see here. Uh, just really seconds you were over a target, and I did shoot this at 64 frames a second which uh, results in a slow motion attitude when you run it back on a projector and then you add the 16 frames uh, a second uh, projection speed now. So it really slows it down considerably. So you get a little better view of it. And it's kind of hard to see on occasion, but uh, it will give you an idea of uh, some of the reactions that uh, the Viet Cong uh, would get whenever they fired on a spotter plane. And of course, this kind of activity went on uh, day after day after day, seven days a week in Vietnam. And as you can see, uh, adjacent to where the smoke plume just came up from the impact of the bomb, uh, there are bomb craters all over this area. All of those white spots that you see, or yellowish spots, are where previous bombs have hit. And of course, this whole area is considered to be Viet Cong territory. There you can see the bomb craters to one side. Very difficult to get any kind of a good picture here because of the speed that we would go in. And we have lost considerable quality between the transfer of the film and, and the videotape. So you have to kind of really look close to see the impact of the bombs and rockets. These are rockets here that are going off. and A whole pot of rockets at one time just uh, really decimates probably an acre or two acres of ground. There you can see bomb craters. And that was Benoit Air Force Base. What really amazed me, a Grumman Hellcat. That's World War II vintage and was flown by the South Vietnamese. Now these films were taken in a pod camera that was mounted on the side of this. This was an A6 twin jet Sky Raider, a marine aircraft, and again out of uh, Benoit. And the type of bombs that they were dropping here were uh, fragmentation bombs, some with timing devices, so that they would detonate at various times, some above the ground, some on the ground, and some uh, several minutes after impact. The one thing they all had in common was they all had a single fin, not two fins, but a single fin. As you can see, they look like uh, a flock of ducks coming out of the bomb racks on the wing. There you can see some of the explosions in the background. 
And these were particularly devastating because they were uh, designed for anti-personnel purposes and not necessarily for destruction of buildings or structures, but uh, for their anti-personnel characteristics. And uh, to the right of the aircraft, you can see some of the bomb craters from a previous run. And uh, the reason they have a single fin is because it uh, tends to spread the bombs in all directions rather than uh, concentrate them in one location. And you can see the sporadic detonation of the bombs in the background there. And again, this type of activity uh, was conducted uh, daily, all day, every day, seven days a week, weather permitting, uh, in Vietnam. And an absolutely incredible uh, display of death and destruction. And of course, as you probably all know, there were more bombs dropped in Vietnam than all the bombs dropped during World War II. And that uh, is just uh, incredible. This was very much like plowing a field. Uh, planes would come in. It was very coordinated. They'd have one flight come in, and then another flight, then another flight. And uh, they would bomb at night, early in the morning, and uh, as I indicated, pretty much all day long. And these fragmentation bombs would be dropped in suspected areas. And again, I underline the word suspected area because they really didn't know if, if uh, there was a regiment, a platoon, or two people in that area. This was based on uh, intelligence information and based on uh, the fact that maybe somebody took a shot at some uh, aircraft. But this was the end result. Hard to imagine that uh, we were ejected from that country so unceremoniously, but we were. Let's hope we never ever have another war. Of course, bear in mind, this is just one small location in Vietnam. This was happening throughout the country in many, many different locations, not only in the Mekong Delta, but in Central Highlands and along the South China Sea and all the way up to the border, and of course, later on, uh, across the border in Vietnam, North Vietnam. So it was a monumental commitment by this country, following a huge commitment by France years preceding, and uh, both the French and our country could not do it. So I guess it's kind of testimonial to the character of the Vietnamese people. We were definitely not